Welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm Steve Leibowitz. We in Israel all remember quite distinctly where we were on October 7th, and we'll never forget some 1,200 civilians and soldiers massacred by Hamas and about 250 taken hostage to Gaza. For the less than 130 hostages remaining alive in Gaza and for their families, the agony is continuing half a year later. There have been 260 soldiers killed in the ongoing Gaza war. May they be of blessed memory, each one. Tens of thousands of Israeli civilians remain out of home since October 7th, both along the Gaza border and in the north, facing Hezbollah attacks. Hundreds of thousands of IDF reservists did months of service, leaving their families to fight the war. Only a few hundred IDF troops now remain in Gaza. All of us who lived the nightmare of the past six months know where we were on October 7th, but where are we now? Joining us to discuss are Aryeh Lightstone, Middle East expert and architect of the Abraham Accords, who joins us from Washington, and Middle East author and analyst, journalist Amot Asael. Amot, if I could, I'd like to start with you. Half a year later, is there a clear picture of how the war is going? Few troops now remain in Gaza. Netanyahu is still insisting that total victory is close and there is a date for the Rafah operation. How would you describe the current game plan? I would say that over the past six months fighting, uh, we've seen um, a major military transition, both physically and psychologically. Physically, Israel has um, killed thousands of Hamas troops. It has demolished a great deal of Hamas's material, and it um, and it blasted uh, miles upon miles of Hamas tunnels. And in this regard, has changed beyond recognition Hamas's capabilities. And unlike what some of its leaders assume, it will not be able to restore these abilities because the IDF has also crossed the psychological Rubicon in its this is in terms of what happened there um, uh, militarily and physically. Um, beyond that, a new Israeli doctrine has emerged. This is a doctrine that is being implemented right now. It's painstaking, especially up north, where we do not know what will now unfold, but we can see that this is the direction, and this is agreeable to a broad Israeli consensus. All right, I, I know that your time is limited, Amos, but thanks for joining us today. Arya, thanks for joining us from the U.S. In the month since October 7, has Israel somehow at least managed to reestablish a level of deterrence? What are our Abraham Accords partners saying behind the scenes? Well, I think you've got several different questions that you're asking there. Israel's deterrence, I think, has been accomplished in a meaningful way. There were all of these concerns about where Israel would be able to fight within Gaza and the tunnels and the amount of casualties that one would see on a daily basis. Now, every Israeli soldier casualty is an enormous tragedy, uh, but the numbers are far less than was originally anticipated. I think both the fighting force of Israel has proven itself in a meaningful way, and I believe that Gaza will be changed forever if the Western powers allow it to be changed forever. And amongst the Abraham Accord countries, when they look at radical Islam, uh, which is evidenced by Hamas, by Hezbollah, by the mullahs in Iran, those are meaningful threats, not just to them physically, but to them ideologically. Look, if you look at this on a basic level, Israel has no concern about being taken over internally by radical Islam. Israel has a physical threat by radical Islamic terrorists that Israel is proving that it will be able to push back and will be able to defeat, whether it will be able to eradicate them is a separate question. Every other modern Islamic country has a concern about which ideology will win. Will it be moderate Islam, as evidenced by the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and uh, the direction that Saudi Arabia is going in amongst others? Or will radical Islam wind up taking over? So this is a battle for the hearts and minds of so many in that part of the region, and they are hoping that Israel destroys uh, the physical caliphate of uh, Hamas. So would you say that, so far at least, the war has been a success in terms of the way it's been carried out, or have there been failures that you want to mention? 
No, of course, there have been failures. No war is perfect. On, on October 7th, uh, Israel had the perception of weakness. Uh, all of us who were in Israel on that date, I think, felt nervous in a way that we never anticipated feeling uh, in the modern state of Israel. And that weakness will take not a little bit of time to overcome. That will take not just this war, but it will take the new posturing of Israel on a go-forward basis in order to be able to do that. The, the biggest concern that's occurred over the last six months has been the Biden administration slowly and now speedily abandonment of Israel. And if you look at the recipe for the Abraham Accords, one of the primary concerns or one of the primary values that was introduced was that the road to the rest of the Middle East ran through Jerusalem. And certainly today, and it has been for the last now several weeks, it seems to the road to the Middle East bypasses Jerusalem. And people are not giving enough credit to the regional weakness that that creates for Israel. Israel on its own will be strong. Israel on its own will be victorious. But Israel to be part of the Middle East that we envisioned, the Abraham Accords and broader, uh, requires the United States of America to recognize that Israel is our number one ally in the region. And my goodness, the Biden administration is failing miserably in that regard. Well, so you're saying that the conduct of the war is being run by the Biden administration. Israel's not making its own decisions. We said we're going to win this war. Why haven't we been in Rafah from day one, if not on day 186? I, I don't understand. Why are you blaming the United States for Israel's failure to win the war? Yeah, so I'm not blaming the United States. There are two different issues. Israel has a war to win. I don't know why Israel hasn't gone into Rafah. I have a strong feeling it has to do with the requirements that the United States of America has put on it, both in terms of our diplomacy that will protect Israel in the United Nations and others, and in terms of our rearmament. I'm not on the inside, so I don't know where either of those stand. Certainly, the lack of veto at the United Nations put everybody on, no on notice. Here's the important part, though, from this. Israel will win the war, whether it takes longer or it takes shorter. Uh, the Israeli military has proven its might, and it's getting stronger and more precise and more effective each and every day. As an American, I've got two very major concerns. Concern number one happened when President Biden came to Israel in the beginning part of the war. He met and he gave a hug to uh, President Herzog and to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and for that, he should be commended. He sent the aircraft carriers, and for that, he should be commended. But if you remember, Egypt, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority refused to meet with him based upon the fake news of the missile that blew up the Indonesian hospital. The Indonesian hospital was not blown up, and it was not hit by Israelis. There was a parking lot that was hit by Islamic Jihad. And the president of the United States of America was rejected for a meeting from three countries that we have enormous sway over, or at least we should have enormous sway over. Could you imagine? President Trump being in the region and being refused a meeting by the PEA and Jordan and Egypt. And once that happened, that demonstrated enormous regional weakness from the United States of America in the region. Now, what's happened from then has been all of the comments about uh, how the US, how Israel is conducting the war. It started with President Biden's Oval Office address, comparing Israel to Ukraine. Those two could not be further apart, demanding that Israel works consistently and constantly on humanitarian aid, and then saying that it will hold Israel to the highest standards of international warfare. All of those things, when you say them out loud, implies that if the United States of America wasn't watching, Israel wouldn't be fulfilling those things. Israel is the most moral, humane army in the history of the world, and to a great degree is hurting Israeli civilians, Israeli soldiers, at the expense of Palestinian civilians. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative, available on the web, Android, and Apple. Arya, just uh, because of what you said about President Biden and his first visit, I just wonder out loud whether President Trump would have even come to Israel on the first days uh, with a war having just started. But, but let's leave that. 
there, there's going to have no, to be... I, I, I want to address that because I think you're asking a very important question. Number one, the war would not have happened had President Trump been the president. Uh, Iran has been funding these uh, uh, terror organizations. This is a war in between Israel and Iran. These are Iranian proxies that have benefited from tens of billions of dollars that the United States of America has given them. Iran was on the ropes in January of 2021, and they've been enriched and emboldened ever since then. And in the case that Hamas would have perpetrated this war, President Trump, I don't believe, would have needed to come. All of the necessary machinations that would have happened on October 8th would have happened with the full-hearted blessing of the United States of America. And what President Trump has repeatedly said is the war needs to be over quickly. And that's true. The longer the war goes on, the harder it is in the Middle East. And absolutely, the United States of America would not have slow walked support for Israel at any point in time over the last six months. And finally, this point is not mentioned nearly often enough. There are five American hostages still being held in Gaza. Do you think for a half a second that a different administration would have treated this differently? And the answer is resoundingly yes. Well, it's a lot of speculation, uh, guesswork. Also, I, I don't want to go, go there because we'll never know. There's going to have to be a rebuilding in Gaza under some non-Hamas rule, we hope. Are the Abraham Accords partners willing to put troops on the ground to distribute humanitarian aid and perhaps help establish a new reality on the ground that's non-Hamas and non-Fatah? Are we even asking them for help? But when you say we, that's a great question. Israel. I, I don't know what the it is. U.S. So, it, it, so Israel is speaking certainly to its Abraham Accord allies and discussing this. You've seen the UAE have some spectacular uh, work on the ground with field hospitals. You've seen Morocco send in shipments. I know that Bahrain is trying to help where they can help in this particular case. Uh, where the United States of America is at, it depends on what your reflexive action is. If your reflexive action is to declare that this deserves a Palestinian state, and therefore we're back to the two-state solution over here immediately after October 7th, so you've missed the entire narrative of what's happened. In 2005, Israel gave the Palestinians the right to govern Gaza, basically with impunity. Hamas took over. You and your listeners don't need a lecture on me for this. The lesson of Hamas being in charge of Gaza for 18 years is not that they should be in charge again of Gaza. So is there a solution outside the box that we're willing to look at? And the answer is this administration is not providing any new outside the box solutions. There is an opportunity for them. You can find them in the Trump Peace to Prosperity Plan of different ways that you can go ahead and bring both peace and prosperity to the people of Gaza and the rest of uh, the the West Bank uh, uh, areas A and B, that's certainly possible, but it will only happen with American leadership, and that's just missing now. So, so it sounds to me what you're saying is we might as well wait it out um, until after the elections, until Trump is back in the White House, and then we'll get a better deal? But I don't know what that means, better deal, or but if you a want better, a better Middle East. A better Middle East. So we should tread, <laughs> tread water in the war, continue fighting the war with or without Washington's backing, what should be our game plan now? Because nobody knows well, for sure if pudding. Trump's going to be elected. The proof is in the pudding. We had a better Middle East under President Trump. People forget that when President Trump took office, ISIS had a caliphate the size of Ohio. Right, All of the issues that were going on in the Middle East were very meaningful, and we left it with five peace treaties in 123 days. Iran was on the ropes, and the PA uh, was, uh, was significantly weakened at that point in time. Uh, where are we today? Well, we've got <laughs> Israel fighting a five-front war with questionable U.S. support. So where does that leave us? It leaves us that Israel has to win the war or win all of the wars that it's currently fighting. But I would be very careful not to make any permanent decisions that happen until you find out who the president of the United States of America is. And, and by the way, it's the Middle East. It's a long game. No permanent decision is going to be made before November anyways. And I would just make that very clear. The United States of America are broadly and robustly supportive of the state of Israel. America likes winners. America wants to see Israel win this war, and it, America wants to see all of the hostages returned. Uh, and short of that, actually demonstrates fairly meaningful Israeli weakness, not just to America, but to the region writ large. I just did the math. It's, it's at least nine months until Trump would come into the White House. What are we going to do for the next nine months? I mean, what 
We can't have a situation. Our troops have been withdrawn from Gaza. There's no control over Gaza. The humanitarian situation is a disaster. We're losing more and more friends on a daily basis. The UN Security Council today is considering uh, whether or not to uh, grant Palestinian statehood to the Palestinian Authority. Um, wh what, what do you suggest we do in the meantime? Yeah, so I, look, the woe was me attitude from Israelis needs to be addressed in two different things. On October 6th, right, Israel was in a situation where it was beating the garbage out of each other. On October 7th, Israel discovered that it's got much more meaningful challenges than internal things. I'd like to make this point exceptionally clear, and I make this point to Americans as well as I do to Israelis. The person you disagree with in your country is your opponent. They are not your enemy. On October 7th, we saw what an enemy is. Enemies should be treated like enemies, and opponents should be treated like opponents. The second Israel loses that narrative, the second the United States of America loses that narrative, at that point in time, we weaken ourselves. We are two incredible countries that are filled with greatness, that have a destiny of hundreds of years in our future, unless we destroy our own destinies. Right now, Israel, and you see this in the streets with the protests, you see that unity starting to weaken. In the United States of America, we're in the midst of an election, and that unity, which hasn't really been there for years now, is weakening our fibers as well. I pray deeply that both of our countries will understand how great that they are and how much unity is required. And all of these problems, the United Nations, with due respect to the United Nations, a security council that has these uh, countries in charge, they may make declarative statements. Israel needs to figure out its own, as they say, Dalit the own, uh, the, their, their own foot in front of their face before they worry about what happens in the United Nations. If you were advising Israel at this point, considering everything you just said about Washington and U.S. relations and the lack of, of uh, coordination, what about this Rafah operation? We've been hearing about it for months. Just today, Netanyahu insisted there's a date. It's going to happen, with or without U.S. approval, apparently, would you say it's worth going directly against demands from the United States? I'd love to see an alternative. I don't know a country that can't return its citizens to its border. I don't know a country that can say we're done without getting all of their hostages back. I don't know what the alternative is. And if the United States of America doesn't want that to happen, it should present a meaningful alternative. I only see the public reporting on this, but Israel has made meaningful attempts for ceasefires that I think were actually poorly negotiated. The other side keeps saying no. The other side also keeps saying no because the United States of America seems to do a better job negotiating on Hamas's behalf than Hamas does. When, when you're pushing for ceasefires without direct linkage to all hostages back, why hostages haven't been returned in six months, it's very clear you're not negotiating with a normal human being uh, in Hamas, and therefore you need to defeat Hamas in any way that you possibly can. And, and history will remember who stood on Israel's side in this very morally clear battle and who did not. I'm trying to think of who has actually stood at our side until today. Uh, we've lost the United Don States. Don Fetterman, Torres. Yes, there they have are. Not lost the United States. There are they have not lost the United States. There are individual Congress people, for example, including some that uh, are quite progressive in their in in American politics. L let me ask before we run out of time. I want to ask you about the northern border. You were just mentioning about people not being able to get back to their homes. There's now six months of cross border exchanges. This heightened speculation of a major op uh, operation. We even scrambled our GPS last weekend to, to confound uh, potential Hezbollah uh, invasion plans. All it did was confuse a lot of us drivers. Any clue where the North is heading? Have you heard anything in Washington? Well, I think the question is, is there an alternative to be able to bring peace back to that border? And, and the question is, are we going to learn any lessons from October 7th? There was a feeling that nobody wanted this war. That was the feeling going on with Hamas that was reported by all intelligence services. It was led by all political leaders. Everybody has some degree of culpability and responsibility for how October 7th wound up happening. You now have the border in the north, and the question is, what is a reasonable ability to return citizens? And if I was a diplomat today, we would be doing everything in our power in order to drive Hezbollah as far away from the border as humanly possible in order to avoid war. Nobody wants this war. But the fact is, 
in general, <clears throat> unless you can return your citizens with safety and security to their own borders, then Israel has lost the war. And Israel cannot lose the war because what message does that send to the Middle East, not just in terms of Israel, but in terms of U.S. values and democracy and uh, all of the rights that we care so deeply about? Ari, I want to get to one more question before we run out of time, and this is your specialty. The Saudis still seem ready for a game-changing move toward normalization with Israel. Are we closer or further away from a deal than we were before October 7th? And is there a deadline for the deal? Well, we moved far away from the deal uh, in January of 2021 when President Biden called the crown prince of Saudi Arabia a pariah and when he re-embraced the Iranians. But we need to reset all of these things. Yes, a deal can be done this summer, and I pray that peace happens at the opportune time with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and with the state of Israel. But it also needs to happen in the correct way. And what I mean by that is if it's purely a transaction or if it looks like it's purely for political purposes, there are people that need to live with this deal for the next 50, 100, or possibly many more years beyond that. Let's get the deal off on its correct foot. And for all of that, I think people need to say, let the war finish, let Israel win the war, let the politics in the United States of America finish, let that settle where it may. And then at that point in time, embrace the opportunity to bring the state of Israel and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia together without politics and without war and without transactions and see if we can rebuild the Middle East that we were on the trajectory for, for peace and prosperity for all of its people. And without a Palestinian state, presumably. Uh, the contemplation of having a Palestinian state today doesn't make any sense. If you look back at the Trump plan uh, uh, offered in January of 2020, it certainly gives a sense of what I think would be tolerable for all of the rest of the nations of the region. The state of Israel needs to decide whether that's current still after October 7th. I don't think it is. I think it needs to be updated, but it should be updated along those parameters and see what can be done. We, you can't. This, this is the challenge with the Middle East. Why are we going back to Oslo? in order to fix something that happened on October 7th. We need to be progressive and figure out what does 2030 look like, not does 1995 look like. And that's the challenge with much of our diplomacy All today. Right. Arie, thank you so much for jumping in and uh, answering more of the questions than I was actually intending to answer, uh, to ask only you. And thanks to Amot Asael that was with us at the beginning of the broadcast. Uh, for more of the latest updates from Israel, Make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.TV. This is Steve, Lee Steve Leibowitz. Thanks for watching. Let's win the war and bring them home.